lecture series. Actually, Paul invited himself. Um, this is uh, Lieutenant Commander Paul Friedrich. Um, he is uh, the chief engineer for the DOD uh, Class 3 PKI. Uh, his history is in the uh, submarine community. Is that right? Mm -hmm. You almost seem like you're too big to be on the submarine. Nope. But, um, and uh, he worked as the um, assistant to the uh, technical director of DISA uh, before taking his uh, current position uh, as one of the people working to make the PKI happen. And uh, he has a wealth of knowledge to share with us. I think uh, you'll all find this a very informative talk. So let's get started. Boy, no, I didn't feel as though I invited myself. My boss oh, said, yeah. if, if I ever stop by, I'd tell you about it. So last Thursday, I uh, you know, said I, I would be here. Uh, and because this is something of an impromptu thing, what I did was uh, refurbish something I presented a, a couple months ago at NSA uh, discussing PKI in a, in a similar audience of people that understand IA at, a, at somewhat of a technical level. Um, yeah, basically, the reason why there's a class 3 PKI now and not just Forteza, which was the only, uh, actually beyond that, back up a little bit, uh, even uh, the Stu3 system is a, uh, an elliptic curve based public key cryptographic system, and it's very good. It's a very mature system. It's probably the best one on the planet. But because it's a single application, it's easy to do it pretty well. Uh, Forteza was a bleeding edge technology attempt at, at having a more general service uh, PKI. Uh, NSA also admits that there were many decisions made back then that couldn't have been made any better at the time, but they, were, they proved not at all uh, very good. Uh, basically, with the uh, uh, President Clinton and uh, um, Al Gore and others interested in, uh, in improving the uh, efficiency of the federal government and going paperless and stuff like that, people started thinking about the promise of digital signatures and not having to have pieces of paper waiting in people's inboxes and, and that sort of thing. Uh, there, the demand was created from on top to go paperless. And it was uh, Dr. Uh, Hamry who was then the, uh, 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 I can't remember, the chief accountant in DOD and now he's the deputy secretary of defense and he's going out here shortly. But he was interested in, in uh, improving business processes in the military and he wanted to focus on travel. Uh, DOD spends billions of dollars a year traveling and a significant amount of that money is just, is just uh, friction. It's just, it's just stuff that doesn't have to happen if we can better automate things. And so it was decided that uh, digital signatures had, uh, were necessary for that to be possible. And th so they quickly turned to the only PKI that existed and they looked at Forteza and they pretty quickly realized that that was about 10 times as expensive as what was needed. And so they quickly looked around and said, hey, can we come up with a PKI in about two months? And we did. Uh, although DTS still isn't uh, functional, isn't operational, and, and now we're in a uh, second version of the PKI and supporting a lot of other applications. But that's pretty much why this came about. Um, Forteza is uh, now, cons now described as being cl a class four system, a class four level of assurance. Uh, class three is essentially what's possible using COTS products today uh, in a uh, vendor neutral, uh, highly scalable uh, COTS system supporting multiple vendor applications. That's essentially what we're shooting for. Uh, even NSA is now envisioning uh, the challenge as being, let's get security out there and improve it over time. Let's evolve rather than keep shooting for what is what we have always considered to be minimally acceptable or we're fooling ourselves, which is also true if you're talking about MLS systems as an example. But if, we are, if we're always shooting for uh, A1 systems and and FIPS level four crypto and, crypt and crypto protocols that don't even exist yet, we'll never get any security. So that's why we're doing this thing right now. Uh, the uh, initiative is uh, essentially a team, teamwork between DIS and NSA. Uh, we have right now a, a root uh, CA at the uh, NSA site at Finksburg, Maryland, where they also have this uh, Stu3 roots and, and EKMS roots and a bunch of other things, the Forteza route. And we have uh, certification authorities now in just two sites in uh, Pennsylvania and Colorado. And we decided that there really wasn't uh, any need to significantly delegate responsibilities either in the directory for the purpose of system administration or for CAs. That, that ended up being too much of a burden on end users or user populations, user communities. And we decided that uh, uh, just sufficient number of cert certification authorities to minimize the chance for single points of failure and those sorts of things are what we're shooting for. Uh, the notions uh, that existed back in X5, uh, X500 and X509 days back in the late 80s were assuming things like the internet didn't exist and PCs were about as big as computers were ever going to get and bandwidth is pretty uh, constraining. And so they thought about distri distribution of CPU responsibilities as an example. 
Um, and now you get things where you can perform uh, 300 cryptograph asymmetric uh, cryptographic operations a second and very high bandwidth uh, connectivity to places like Yahoo and, and uh, uh, Microsoft.com, which you never see go down uh, except on rare circumstances. But it's just we have a, a fundamentally different uh, paradigm of what we can expect from a global service. Uh, we have registration authorities. Uh, we right now have about 50 or 100, I can't remember, but we're, we envision possibly uh, 500 to 1,000 throughout DOD. Uh, and their primary responsibilities are to generate local registration authorities who are responsible for registering end users. We think there'll be a couple thousand of those, a few thousand of those. And uh, we're primarily focusing on uh, end users and web servers at the moment, and we're expanding functionality. There are about four different dimensions of the challenge, functionality, uh, level of assurance, uh, availability, scalability, kinds of issues. And we're just trying to address them in parallel rather than completely solving one and then, then moving on in other directions. By the way, I, what, I'm gonna just, uh, much of this is over you just to get a feel for what we're doing. I'll touch on some topics. Some of these topics we could talk about for 10 days straight, no kidding. And I, I might attempt to do about five minutes on something, but as much as anything, uh, realizing that some of you may have to go someplace in about 40 minutes, I'll, I'll go over them at a high level and then we could talk about them. I'm here till six, so whatever you guys want. Um, we've issued now about uh, 50,000 certificates and we honestly haven't yet begun to ramp up because right now there's a, uh, another version looming called, we're calling 2.0. It'll be operational in May of this year. Uh, the pr predominant uh, characteristics of this, it'll be a higher level of assurance because uh, we'll be, the CA keys will be in hardware, which is not, uh, was not generally the case about two and a half years ago in COTS products when we, when we implemented this first. Uh, we'll also be supporting key escrow and recovery and a couple of other areas. Gen generally, it's uh, availability type issues. Face-to-face -face registration is a policy requirement. Uh, and it, w the procedure we have is, is using a shared secret where that local registration authority generates a shared secret, uh, prints it out, and SHA-1 hashes it, sends the SHA-1 hash in a in, uh, high integrity uh, session to the, the uh, infrastructure. And then that, that uh, user later demonstrates knowledge of that one-time password. And once it has been successfully used, the, uh, the shared secret up on the infrastructure is destroyed. We, d we discovered that that is uh, not as secure as rigorous face-to-face -face at the point when the private key is generated. It's significantly uh, uh, because the, the end user has to protect this thing until it's used. But once it's used, it, there's no uh, uh, confidentiality uh, requirement associated with it. But we realized that was a significant improvement over the uh, concept of operations for Forteza as an example. So that, that was a uh, uh, important uh, characteristic of the system, uh, and it still is. Uh, end user keys are in software, which is obviously the, uh, uh, a very significant uh, vulnerability of the system. We, we're not promising that any end user's private key is in a, in a hardware token. It can be, but again, uh, we want to get uh, something out there, and because of uh, smart card interoperability, API interoperability, just interoperability between some of the cost products up at the application level until very recently has been a significant challenge. And we decided that we had to get something out there, and this would be pretty good. Uh, in general, I think uh, basically at the policy people have been uh, classifying class three, class four, class five, and they're trying to think of it from a system perspective, from, a, from an academic perspective, an objective perspective. Uh, what's, what's comparable at a human process level, what's comparable at a private key protection level, uh, what's comparable at an infrastructure protection level kinds of things, and then saying, okay, these are good enough for class three, these are good enough for class four, but that's possibly not or that may not be the optimal way for us to do this. As an example, I think people uh, would, would enjoy the use of a smart card for user flexibility as much as anything else. And, and it, uh, we have become used to getting, as an example, uh, American Express gold cards or something like that in the mail that are good for $75,000 and you get a pin in the mail two weeks later. And so you have a, a single private key. The, the use of that private key can be demonstrated several times subsequent to that. And as long as there, there is some sort of a signature saying, I acknowledge responsibility for this, it's arguable that, the, that uh, smart cards issued to end users is something of greater value to us than the fact that they, we went through a rigorous face-to-face -face process, as an example. So it's something people are thinking about, but right now the policy doesn't really address. But I think that that's going to be what's considered minimally acceptable best business practice in the next couple of years. Uh, because that's what people are used to now with ATM cards and smart card, or, uh, uh, credit cards. Uh, we are, uh, we've always uh, rigorously enforced functional separation. If you refer to uh, 
uh, the business requirement for digital signature, but until recently, uh, we've been issuing two certificates, one which we call an ID certificate, which asserts digital signature and non-repudiation, and another one which, which asserts uh, digital signature and key encipherment, and which has the email address in the certificate. The reason we did that is there had not up until that point been any COTS products that supported functional separation of keys. The concern is that uh, you, uh, there's a, uh, an application level functional requirement to be able to recover data. In order to be able to recover data, you have to be able to recover the bulk encryption key. If you, if you, need, if you have to get to the bulk encryption key, you have two ways you must have prepared yourself. Either you made a copy of that application level encryption key and stored it someplace else. That's what Skipjack does and the, and the uh, key, uh, key enforcement, I can't, leaf, law enforcement, yeah, I can't remember what it is. But you can handle it at the application level by, by uh, supporting it at that level. Or you can have the private key associated with that uh, key encipherment escrowed by some other means. And that has, uh, it seemed to be the way uh, industry is going. And it is now supported in several COTS products. Uh, Microsoft, for one, by the way, uh, still is not seriously looking at this. They can't figure out how to make it work, which is not to say they're stupider than anyone else. But they think that key recovery on any scale and, and uh, in a way that uh, won't cause their customer support lines to you know, go bonkers uh, just isn't ready yet. They can't figure out how to do it. And I th uh, key escrow is relatively simple key recovery because it requires delegation, uh, which makes it similar to the challenges associated with directories. Uh, it, it's, it's very hard. We'll get into that a little bit later, the directories generally. But uh, with this version 2 system, uh, now that Outlook 98 and uh, Communicator 4.7 with uh, Personal Security Manager, both support functional separation. And I'm pretty sure Lotus Notes 5.2 and later do as well. Uh, it's possible to have your uh, message key, or, I'm sorry, your encryption key separate from the key you use to sign things within the, this mail application. And the important thing is that uh, it's possible in the event that a person dies in a plane crash, as an example, their organization can recover the information that was, rec that was encrypted with their encryption public key and their certificate. But at the same time, uh, for business reasons, it's appropriate that there is no copy of a signature or a private key used to sign things for, in a business transaction. So that uh, that transaction or that uh, uh, signature can, as an example, hold up in court later on. And so we're now supporting that uh, rigorously. The the whole notion of whether uh, what non-repudiation means as opposed to digital signature is a is a a big red herring right now, unfortunately. Uh, if anyone's really interested in PKI and X509, I can tell you about that later. But basically, people uh, over a decade ago thought that there was some difference between a digital signature and non-repudiation. And now, <coughs> the last five years, no one knows what the difference is. And people are fighting over how many angels are on the head of a pin. And they can't figure out what to do with these two things, which are functionally separate or identical. But they, they have to come up with some semantic associated with it because they're there. Uh, and it's amazing how many brilliant people are trying to solve that problem. Uh, users may use smart cards right now, but they don't have to. The, the uh, uh, significant link with Franco right now is R, uh, RSA's PKCS 12, which is uh, used for private key portability. And we do enjoy uh, interoperability between a large number of products right now, just in this, this common desktop space. Uh, Lotus Notes, uh, all Microsoft products and all Netscape products. And there are other ones like KyberPass and a bunch of others in other application spaces. But because uh, certainly uh, PKCS 12 is not as strong as your average uh, rigorously implemented smart card, it's better than nothing and it does provide you interoperability and there is essentially no smart card worth its salt that is vendor neutral today. So it, it's just right now the best we can do. Again, we're trying to get, get cryptography out there and then raise the bar when COTS products can support and when, when standards support. So we're getting the stuff out there and then trying to talk to the vendors and the, the uh, standards communities to make that possible. By the way, as far as uh, private keys and software, um, something to consider when addressing smart cards is there's a lot of uh, um, marketing right now within the DOD for smart cards because of, uh, there's a, uh, an access card office under OSD, uh, Mary Dixon, who also works with uh, or under uh, the Defense Manpower Data Center just up the road here. Uh, they're working on the Common Access Card, which is a smart card version of the DOD ID card. And it's a really great program, and we're working very closely with it, and this is the way to go. But uh, it, it, at the same time, it's easy to oversell smart cards vis-a-vis -vis software versions of crypto. And it's, uh, it's easy to get sound bites that are completely misleading. And it's appropriate that people that understand the technology understand exactly where the differences are. Uh, FIPS level four crypto modules, the highest that NIST is, has uh, uh, classified, supports private keys and software. Not a problem. 
as long as it's encrypted with a good enough algorithm with a large enough key and you're protecting the key adequately. Uh, the the uh, PKCS 12 blob uses triple DES. If you used a password that was as strong as a triple DES key, so you used a password that has 128-bit entropy in it, um, it would not be user friendly. But NSA couldn't break into it. So the, uh, so the, so the trade-off between a smart card and software is user friendliness and then if you try to attack the user friendliness by th considering uh, how small you can make a password, you compare it to a smart card where actually a four digit pin can be adequate. Actually, uh, the NIST people think five is minimally necessary, but, but uh, the reason is you can copy a floppy, it's true. You can, you can copy, make a million copies and then put uh, um, a million instances of a power PC or something like that and start banging against it. And, and because the uh, triple DES uh, key is, is pretty tough not to crack, you would go for what might be a weak password. Um, but if, if you're incapable of copying the key and you have a way of ensuring that there is a password protection mechanism in place that can't be circumvented where it disables the key after some small number of bad attempts, then you have a way of protecting the private key using what is the, the weak, otherwise weakest uh, way of accessing it. Um, and so you're capable of uh, reducing the chance that that key can be compromised. So, so you can, with that mechanism, make a smart card uh, much more user friendly. But that, that is precisely where the difference is. Um, um, revocation in PKI is uh, still practically science fiction. The, um, uh, something to realize at an uh, almost theoretical level of PKI, any signed assertion whatsoever, whether it's a signed attribute in a directory, whether it's an attribute certificate, or whether it's a public key certificate, you're making an assertion about something that was true in the past. And there, there may be some functional reasons why that is necessary. As an example, if you're, if you're traveling on a plane or you're out in the battlefield and you don't have, you don't have some means of, of uh, uh, assuredly going to some uh, reference to see whether something is still true, you have, to, you have to accept something that was true in the past, and, but something that you can still cryptographically verify. And that's where you get the notion of a CRL, um, a certificate revocation list, which uh, may be 10 minutes old, it may be two weeks old, and you have to make a decision, is it worth your while seeing whether there's a more recent one to see whether the particular certificate you're about to rely on is still valid, uh, or whether two weeks ago is good enough. Online certificate status protocol is the most popular notion that is in conf or, uh, competition with CRLs. Um, it's actually uh, widely disparaged by uh, most of the rigorous PKI community as being something that will not scale and is actually worse of a performance hit. It's, it's just interesting how, how radically different these are. Online certificate status protocol is essentially more like a directory where you're, you're taking a look at a real-time uh, resource and, and getting a, an immediate reply on the status of a particular certificate. And it can be signed and dated and things like that. So you, it, it's also something you can retain. Uh, and it's very much analogous to how you're checking credit cards at stores. Uh, Fifteen years ago, any of you might remember if you walk in with a credit card in a store, they pump out this long list and see whether your, your credit card's still good or your check is still good at a Navy Exchange or something like that. And more recently, they just uh, swipe the thing and it, it goes checks and then it's, it's fine. So the, the former is like CRLs, the latter is like OCSP. What if the phone line goes down? You have nothing unless you also have something analogous to a CRL, one of those printouts. So, the, uh, so possibly the combination of the two is going to make the most sense. But uh, because, now this is an example of one of the trade-offs we have though, because we have one root and four intermediate CAs right now, we're about to go to eight because of two different systems. But because we're issuing certificates to uh, initially, nominally, something like three million people, and we'll each have two or three certs, and if, when you start going to every single network node and, and process and, you know, down 10 years from now, um, the Deers database, as an example, has 23 million entries just for people. Uh, and if you're talking manpower, you're going to talk about every last, uh, you know, uh, chip that can talk a protocol after a while. Um, uh, just looking at something like 3 million people, we're, uh, one estimate of our CRL will be that it will be 8 meg in size. And so that's a significant latency problem, especially if you're talking about in the battlefield. And for this reason too, by the way, it's imperative to uh, understand something else fundamental about PKI. Uh, technology, you'll, I think you'll see this in the later slide too. I, uh, one thing I've learned and I've seen other people uh, pound the table about this, um, I think the thing that technology is best at is to eliminate the need for compromise. The, uh, 
And some technologies are bad because they create compromises that weren't otherwise necessary. One of the fundamental flaws with Forteza as a concept was that they, they put uh, concepts like uh, user attributes in a public key certificate. Uh, pu uh, the public key infrastructure is used to, allow, to provide electronic credentials for subjects. It, it's a means to an end. It's, uh, it's, uh, as an example, right now we're working very closely with DMDC, which is the reason why I'm out here in the first place. DEERS is the fundamental concept. It is, it, it, this is in a later slide too. It's, it's a, we're capturing identities in the sky. They know our mother's maiden names and things like that. They know where, you know, if, if we go AWOL, they'll find us because of the information that's in DEERS. In a couple years, they'll have all our active duty military people DNA in that thing. They, they will know identity cold. Forteza never understood identity. NSA talks about INA, but they don't know what the I means. Uh, uh, the Navy realized what I meant as soon as John Walker walked along because uh, we realized that, that we, uh, he was circumventing what might have been possible because everything was done locally. Uh, spies know that they can, they can uh, possibly best infiltrate a system by create, faking an identity, creating some, somebody that doesn't exist. Uh, so the, the most fundamental thing for us to realize in this space is that we have captured identity centrally and we have authoritatively and uh, assuredly uh, managed the, the understanding of the existence of people. Then you need, uh, you need to provide them sort of, some sort of a credential. And they already have this. They've been doing this for a long time. They have, they have a rapid process which has been issuing these paper credentials. And that's a client-server relationship and it's becoming ever more mature. And it's the registration process, which is, again, more fundamental than PKI. PKI is just a different technology to put inside that piece of paper. Uh, it, it, uh, we were trying to do the same thing. They've been doing it longer than we have. They, knew, they understand this stuff better than we do. And PKI should be invisible. It's a means to an end, and no end user should ever have to know anything about it. Um, the, uh, so so the, the technology works as long as the subject asserted in the credential is in sole possession of the private key that has been certified by the PKI. As long as that's all the PKI as a technology is promising to do, we're not making any compromises. But if you start using that very same mechanism to also assert that the person has certain clearance or currently has some local affiliation with some Navy organization, uh, then you have to start worrying about, in the, in the case of Forteza, it's not even so much that you have to frequently revoke certificates because if you have 10 things asserted in the certificate, you're now 10 times likely to have to revoke it. And we already talked about this, the perspective or the possible sizes of CRLs. But also you have to figure out human processes uh, where during the registration process, you get those 10 authorities in the same room that the, at the same time the person comes in. So just really bad technology. So the right answer is you, you figure out what someone's fundamental identity is, you provide them a name, you give them a way of, of authenticating themselves, and then you handle things like uh, transitory identity or, or uh, clearances or other attributes about the person by some other means, some other technology. Now that can be supported by public key infrastructure by having them uh, digitally signed information. An attribute certificate is, is essentially a little different than a signed value within a directory. It's just uh, an assumption of the operational uh, CONOP it's either located in a directory or held by the individual. The latter really doesn't make a lot of sense. It's, that's just a question of how the uh, application protocols work. Object signing certificates, um, big deal right now. This is, this is turning into uh, some forest fires in the Beltway. Um, I, this, this is another interesting area. Um, I'll go over very briefly. We can talk about this for hours too. People who stare at a desktop and, and write code and they think about access control and they think about uh, Java code and ActiveX and COM and things like that and, and jar files and stuff like that, they think, oh my God, I have a big problem. And it's true. It's very true. But um, basically, the whole notion of signed objects was first implemented in commercial scale by Netscape and Microsoft very closely after that followed suit. Um, and the, the fact that uh, we, should, we should look at what is available very objectively, very critically, before jumping on board something. Something to realize about any security service of any description, or any service that is security relevant. PKI is very obvious because it's on a sensible security service. Directories are, are an example though of, of something comparable. If, if you are currently relying on nothing, you're possibly safer than if you start relying on a security safe, uh, s service if you don't understand it or you are trusting it more than you, would, you should. Uh, if, if, we, if we're issuing software credentials and people start sending TSSI stuff or SCI stuff over the internet, we're probably worse off than we were before when no, no idiot would do that. And this is one of those examples. 
Uh, right now, object signing certificates, um, uh, first of all, I, the, the fundamental thing is there shouldn't be such a thing as an object signing certificate. The uh, uh, people that, have, that wish to uh, trust a particular signer, uh, let's say Spayware is implementing something. You, you guys have envisioned something. Spayware is implemented at some place at, at Paycom or something like that. And they, Paycom wants to trust Paycom's objects. So the Paycom community should trust Paycom to sign objects. But that's not how the COS products are implemented. Paycom has to trust the VeriSign root, or in our case, the DoD root. And Paycom is forced to trust every object signed by anybody with an object signing cert in DoD. So if we issue 400 object signing certificates to 400 different developers, there's going to be some lab in Kansas that gins up the, the object from hell and blows away Paycom just before uh, China invades Japan or whatever, Taiwan. Um, the, uh, it just it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense from the application's perspective, and it doesn't make sense from the PKI perspective. PKI is not competent. Uh, if it, were, if it were to be responsible for determining whether an individual object signer is either competent or trustworthy in signing objects. And so the lawyers from the, from the DOD perspective would say, we're not going to do this. This doesn't make any sense. So that, that the whole thing is just screwy. Microsoft products seem to have the granularity to actually allow subjects to trust individual uh, signature certificates, but it still requires the uh, extensions in the certificate that, that assert object signing. Netscape doesn't even uh, provide that granularity yet. So we're working with the vendors. I'm afraid this may be a force majeure issue, and I'm going to have to start issuing the certs anyway, but it's really stupid, unless you guys can convince me otherwise. Um, we are following both uh, the IETF PKICs and the federal PKI initiatives. Uh, this is not easy. These guys uh, seem to flip coins every other week. And uh, I just created a route with a 30-year history, and I made it the last-minute decision based on a change to a document made the week before in the federal PKI. So standards are not standard. Uh, it's, it's really tough. And there are some very significant differences between PKICs and the, and the federal PKI. So this is, this is really tough. We'll get into a couple of details. Registration interfaces uh, is essentially the only thing that is not vendor neutral in the current implementation. It's, it's awkward. Uh, there, uh, the registration uh, interfaces between the crypto module that contains the user's private key and the CA um, is, is, is awkward. Possibly it's, it's unnecessary. As an example, uh, uh, the rapid system where we get our ID cards uh, will be upgraded in something like October of this year so that you'll get a, a smart card. I'll put it back in my wallet. The, uh, I'll pass this around. This is uh, actually going to be pumped out by the Rapids client, and that has uh, the, the uh, private keys and certificates on it. And so that'll be invisibly handed out. Uh, and so that'll be the registration process. And if, if that is natural, and that's, that's more comparable to what we saw with Forteza and Macaw in the, in the ORA. And, if that's, and that's what end users should expect. And it certainly increases the security of the system. So possibly it's not that big a deal that we don't have uh, standard registration interfaces since that's part of the infrastructure. But uh, that, that is going to replace the DOD ID card. Uh, we'll still continue to use the, uh, the uh, more labor-intensive local registration authority, but that's also necessary to support things like web server certificates and uh, router certificates and things like that. Uh, we already talked about this. Uh, uh, database, uh, ba basically, um, uh, our challenges are enormous. I, I was over at MicroStrategy. I don't know if anyone is familiar with that. It's a, it's a data warehousing company, a decision support company down in the DC area. They, uh, they've been around for a while. They, uh, about eight years doing uh, decision support in very large systems. And they, they can implement, we're talking terabyte databases and uh, just enormous uh, amounts of data. They can walk into some major corporations and implement very complicated systems in about two weeks. And they go into some federal agencies and they can't help them in six years. And the reason is, and this is essentially uh, true of both PKI as a challenge and directories as a challenge, we don't know who in the DOD even owns information. The, it, it's all politics. And it's not negative politics, it's just reality. It's, it's, it's not even a technical challenge. Um, in, the, in the case of something like uh, um, even very complicated multinational corporations, they are at least capable of having a personal database which is homogeneous throughout the corporation. And they have already issued employee ID numbers. DOD doesn't have that today. And they've already issued uh, photo ID certs with the employee ID number. DOD doesn't have that today. We're trying, to get that, we're trying to get that back now. And uh, the, the, the single biggest challenge for us uh, as a country are the Privacy Act and the Social Security Act. 
uh, countries, uh, European countries don't have the same problems and I bet they're going to actually blow us away in some object technologies in the next few years unless uh, those, those acts get changed. Because object technologies don't make sense unless you can get unique names for objects and you can't do that without violating the Privacy Act or the Social Security Act. Um, it's, a, it's, it's actually a really thorny issue. Uh, we're getting away with that here because these, these will be analogous to an employee ID number. Uh, social, oh, another thing. Uh, social Security number for 2.5 million active duty and government service uh, personnel. There are 4,000 duplicate Social Security numbers in that space. It, within the DEERS database, in order to ensure uniqueness, they need the social security number, the first three characters of your last name, and your date of birth. No two of those are adequate to ensure uniqueness. Uh, the social security number errors tend to go along with the same full name or the same date of birth. Um, so, and on, on top of that, it's obviously inappropriate for people to, to use in their access control lists one's social security number. So basically what, uh, the directory people and the uh, database people, dis personnel people, independently decided was that we need a static number for everybody. And by the way, uh, identity uh, is interesting. Uh, these DEERS people, DMDC down the street, have, a, again, a, a very profoundly mature understanding of a lot of this stuff. I, I tell NSA, you want to learn about uh, PKI? Talk to DMDC. They, they've been doing PKI for 30 years. This is just technology. This is math, what we're doing. Um, they think of, uh, they think it's ludicrous for PKI and directories to consider the human name as part of our identity. It's just an attribute. Um, basically, they're, uh, they're employing an EDIPN, which, we are, uh, which is going to be a 10-digit ten ten number. And the uh, PKI and directory community within DOD is, is going to make that the same as a 10-character UID. And it'll just be understood semantically that they're, they're uh, mappable but at a, at a computer level, they're understood to be different kinds of values. And, and this will be very, very important. Uh, right, we realized for ourselves, I, I am incapable of ensuring, it's, it's trivial, by the way, technology, it's technically easy, it's trivial to ensure that you never name two people the same thing or two anything the same thing. That's easy. And you can do that by allocating numbers or you can use hierarchies like X500 as a, by the way, the difference between X500 and LDAP is almost nothing. There's this big uh, religious war about that. Uh, it's difference in protocols and things like that, but logically they're, they're essentially the same thing. And they're both radic uh, LDAP is just a, uh, a directory access protocol, but a single DIT is in our directory information tree, a single hierarchy is, com is just uh, completely uh, incapable of, of reflecting reality. The, there are too many dimensions to reality to be able to reflect in a single DIT, which is why, fundamentally why directories are, are falling on their faces yet. Um, I'll get into that a little bit later. But uh, uh, Microsoft, Netscape, and Novell independently realized they needed UIDs and distinguished names didn't make any sense. They're, that's just a, a construct of a bunch of or 100 people that were in a room uh, 12 years ago now and decided that was a good idea. But uh, uh, Microsoft came up with GUID, Net, Netscape came up with UID, and Novell did something else. And that's, that's actually what they're using for uniqueness. And uh, the database people are doing the same thing. So we're just making them all the same thing. But this, uh, by having a, uh, an employee ID number, having credentials with that number, now means access control lists everywhere can refer to exactly that same ID, or that name is the point. So every access control list can have the same name. And so now we, it, what, that's a very hard transition. It's, uh, there are actually very subtle challenges to that. DMDC understands things like mother's maiden name, social security number, date of birth. And your local area administrator understands things like what room number you are and what your land printer assignment is. Th those two, you know, that how, how that fundamental mapping is done initially is, is a very hard challenge. But once you get to the point where you functionally separated the ability to authenticate and the ability to grant access, then the third one is how you manage privilege. But the point is these three have nothing to do with one another. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't try to make that uh, the way it is. But some people ha can implement PKI in a trivial time because they already have a database, they already have employee ID numbers, and they already have photo IDs. So it's just a question of, of refreshing what they have and proof they have a, have a complete PKI. It's very, very difficult for the, for the DOD to do this. Um, if you do this out of order, you're fooling yourselves, you'll just have to start all over again. Uh, without this, we would be incapable of uh, being sure that we would never grant the same person two different names or be sure that we wouldn't be changing their names over, over their lifetime, over their career. Um, that's it. 
Uh, the fundamental challenge then is uh, for applications. Uh, this is, I'm sorry, this, this, uh, these slides were presented to a bunch of vendors in addition to people at NSA. Uh, this is, if we're talking about initial capability with PKIs, you want to use COTS products. A lot of COTS products don't do some of this stuff. Public key technology uh, often doesn't use a public key infrastructure. The, infra the value of an infrastructure is that you're relying on a trusted third party so that you can make, uh, uh, you can uh, validate a signature or encrypt something intended for an intended uh, recipient without having any a priori arrangement with the individual. Uh, but some public key enabled uh, products uh, are public key based but, but uh, don't use certificates like that. So they're, they're not generally scalable or, or interoperable. Um, yeah, revocation scalability we talked about before. That, um, people are thinking about things like Delta CRLs where you just, you just publish each week what, what new entries were created uh, each week. Uh, there are other ways of doing things. Basically, uh, we'll try anything. We're going to essentially pilot everything and, and, and provide them as operational services to be trustworthy, trustable. But uh, uh, the whole world is looking at the DoD PKI because this is the biggest one on the planet that's not uh, vendor spe or application specific. Uh, so it'll be really interesting. Business signatures is radically different. Um, if um, if you're talking about notions of uh, traditional IA, traditional uh, computer security, network security, you're interested in things like uh, identification, authentication, access control, authorization, integrity, those sorts of things. Uh, you want uh, ex the uh, fundamental example in, uh, in PKI related uh, applications is you either want to provide confidentiality of something over the network or you want to securely authenticate somebody before granting ac remote access to them. And so you're interested in protecting a resource uh, real time. And so you, you, you make or break your system real time. And once you've granted access, you've, you've kind of lost it because you have no idea what happened. But as long as, but once, once the access has been granted, you don't care. You know, it's, the, it's, it's water under the bridge. So you're focusing on, on barrier control kinds of, of notions. But business signatures are radically different. And again, it's interesting because this is what drove the PKI, the best business PKI. And this is where the money is. Um, uh, a business signature is radically different. And this possibly is something not to be confused with the notion of non-repudiation generally. Uh, basic, basically, non-repudiation uh, makes sense it, as an academic uh, security service. Uh, first of all, it is often confused with the notion of messaging. Uh, it is. Um, it doesn't have to have to do with messaging specifically, uh, although I think it is completely true that it's a an application level concept, and it has it's peculiar to whatever application you're talking about. Non repudiation is, in general, academically saying uh, there's a service provided so that uh, people participating in some act are not uh, easily capable of denying that that participation in the future. Uh, more often than not, uh, examples tend to be messaging. They tend to refer to uh, uh, SMIME, uh, non-repudiation of receipt, non-repudiation of transmission. It makes no sense that there would be a non-repudiation bit set in a key usage of a certificate that was issued because uh, certificates are supporting very low level atomic uh, asymmetric crypto operations. Have, has nothing, you have no idea what this thing is going to be used for. There's no way that, that the infrastructure can assert the, the thing, uh, what this, this private key would be used for. People are starting to throw around, again, they're trying to throw meaning on it. They're trying to say that there is intent associated with a non-repudiation bit. So if a three-star general accidentally uses his non-repudiation private key rather than his digital signature private key, that would be a very bad mistake is what they're saying, which is absolutely ludicrous because the whole, that's, that's orthogonal to the whole notion of what a PKI is. PKI is, is cryptographically making it impossible for anything other than what is relied upon to be true. That's that no one else could possibly have this private key. But if you're saying a simple mistake of using the wrong private key is, is very bad, it, that, that makes no sense at all. Um, also, if we're talking about levels of assurance associated with, well, how strongly do we authenticate this person before we, we certify the private key that they demonstrated they possessed? Or uh, how strongly is the private key protected? Things like that. <coughs> and we, we call those different levels of assurances, which are asserted in the certificate policies, by the way, of, of a certificate. And we call them class two, three, four, five. What's the difference between a non-repudiation bid in a class two certificate and a digital signature certificate without a non-repudiation bid asserted in a class four certificate? Are those orthogonal concepts? It's just, it just, it make, it just 
the bunch, the bunch of noise in this area. It's very awkward. But getting back to business signatures, which is real, non-repudiation is, is kind of noise, especially in the PKI world, not necessarily in, in uh, security systems generally, but understand that it's, it's an application level concept, an application specific concept. Um, business signatures is a very real challenge. Uh, and it's very different from conventional security. It's, it's money, it's liability, it's lawyers. Uh, you want to be able to prove three years in the future that it was not possible for John Smith not to have signed something. So uh, it's, it's looking at it from this perspective, it's almost easy to walk into the Admiral and promise that uh, my system will not be broken into in three years from now. It's possible to make it so that you can say that. Or it's possible for you to say, I can't absolutely say that, but this is how they're going to break in. Or this is the area where we may have vulnerability, but we don't yet know. You can characterize it. You can accept risk. Uh, that, that's that's a, a, a relatively logical thing. But if, if, you're, if your concern is um, uh, prosecuting, so now it's beyond, you have to, you have to have the, this is beyond preponderance of the evidence, it's beyond reasonable doubt that nothing could possibly have happened some, somewhere between 1993 and 1996 to either the infrastructure or the person's private key or there might have been a Trojan horse in the person's application when the signature was made, those kinds of things. Uh, possibly the certificate expired two days after the signature was made. Possibly the signature was revoked two hours after the signature was made. Um, Five years from now, how do you say who proves you know, what to whom? Uh, very difficult challenges. Uh, and for this reason, generally, um, notions of uh, time stamping or notarization are being talked about in the PKI. It, it is, uh, it's appropriate that a relying party, if, if their reliance on the PKI is to support non, uh, business signature requirements, uh, that they have adequately addressed, the, by the way, this is a very big deal for uh, the military and the Navy, too. Uh, we, we pay more money in contracts than anybody else. Um, uh, and again, this is what drove the, us to going to the PKI. But um, um, provide enough evidence that uh, the signature was accepted no later than some time. And this can be uh, done possibly by a signature with a timestamp of a trusted third party with a GPS, you know, kind of a system or something like that, and, and that's a trusted system, and then the records for that are retained, and you know, that could be, uh, or uh, possibly you, you have enough other uh, business transactions that occurred immediately after the signature was accepted, as an example of, uh, but there's another notion. The, the academic understanding of, a, of a, a signature is, if you sign a blank piece of paper, um, that signature should be able to hold up in court. Uh, and it, if it's a Forteza signature or something like that, no Trojan horses and stuff like that, that should be a strong si signature. Well, the lawyers are going to say, well, that's stupid. You're wasting your money. That's a useless signature. The value of the signature is proportional to the contents of the, of the document. And, and the lawyers would also say, because, of, because a, a transaction isn't just an instance in time or an instant in time, it, it, there's, there's a continuum of the transaction. We actually delivered the product to you my, my, uh, my suppliers delivered it, you know, the parts to me immediately after I got this thing in. There's, there's enough uh, corroborating evidence that can stand up in court. So it just, it's kind of interesting. Some things the lawyers say you need stronger things than, than the security people say. In other, other places, they say, no, no, don't worry about that. So it's just an interesting challenge. It's different. Um, uh, it's relatively simple for us to address uh, uh, having a homogeneous, let's see, DoD PKI is, is uh, asserting nothing other than a single level of assurance, a single policy uh, across all of the Department of Defense, uh, but uh, just so that, just to the extent that that's appropriate. We're not saying you should, you should trust one another just because you have a certificate. You should use it for essentially no more than you're using DOD ID cards today. Um, uh, and so it, it makes sense that it will be, that it is appropriate that the different uh, domains of trust that exist are, are reflected in different PKIs, essentially. And, and uh, the, the, the technology should reflect reality. And trust is one of those fundamental things in reality you don't want to, you know, you can't change with, with technology. Um, and so there, the whole notions of how, how people in two different domains can interoperate um, is, is a significant challenge. Uh, recently, it became more and more obvious that a vast majority of the people in this uh, 
sector have been focusing on interoperability from the perspective of the relying parties, the people verifying signatures, the people relying on the certificates. And so people have always been focused on things like uh, cross-certification and the federal PKI folks are talking about bridge certification authority. Uh, the DOD has, has a uh, concept of external certification authorities, which is a, a near-term kludge where we, we uh, uh, acknowledge the existence of some commercial uh, uh, crypto service providers who are issuing certificates just to DOD business partners. And so the people in DOD who choose to interoperate with those, those populations would also trust those routes. But because neither of these other technologies are ready for prime time, that's the best all anyone can do. That was a uh, policy decision made it up at a level above the technologist, but it, you really can't do anything else today. But um, uh, that's really not DOD's primary challenge. It's a big one. But uh, fundamentally, what we've been addressing in the PKI is the other challenge, the key holders challenge, interoperability of the private key. Um, uh, people like uh, the, the most, most mature uh, vendor on the planet today for PKI stuff is Entrust. They, they tout interoperability at the relying party level uh, end, but they don't care in the least for interoperability at the private key level because they want to be the 900 pound gorilla in the market space. You can't move an Entrust private key. You can't share an Entrust private key. If we went with Entrust, every single process on the planet would have to be coded to the Entrust API. We don't want that. So we're, what we're doing this, these days is that PKCS12 blob where we can send it between crypto modules, which isn't optimal, but it's, it works. And it really, it's just there's no customer support. It's all COTS. It's, it's relatively invisible. Or uh, better yet is that we have a smart card that is really uh, vendor neutral and, and portable across platforms. Uh, vendor neutral interoperability, uh, again, more than just uh, cross certification. Uh, we're, we're always faced with the functionality and interoperability trade-off. Uh, uh, if you add things like key escrow and recovery, then it's harder to, to retain uh, the vendor neutrality one is currently enjoying. If you're doing more sophisticated key management, or more sophisticated key management, it's harder to do that in a vendor, vendor neutral way. In general, we've been doing uh, the uh, uh, least necessary that is still vendor neutral to the extent possible. And the registration interface is the only thing that's not vendor neutral, uh, although now we added key escrow, so that, that's a little bit more vendor specific. Uh, we're using uh, CMC and CRMF for those that understand that stuff. And the only other one on the planet that's really any viable alternative is CMP that Entrust uses. Um, we talked about those. Uh, smart cards, basically uh, the, the uh, Deers Rapids uh, folks are using that card, which is floating around. Um, the, um, they're calling it a common access card. Uh, Marv Langston was the CI is the CIO of the DOD. I don't remember if he's left yet, but he had a vision that uh, we should have a single credential that we use for building access and things like that. Uh, some confusion about whether access permissions are actually on the card or things like that. And you know, we, the technologists convinced them that no, you just want the ability to authenticate and, and map to an identity someplace in the sky and that uh, privilege and access control be managed precisely where privilege and access control wants to be controlled and managed. Um, uh, there, it's, uh, this card is based on Java card, it's a Sun implementation, uh, so we're very hopeful that uh, that will be adequately secure because it does uh, provide promise for both multi-applications and for vendor neutrality. The uh, smart card vendors that are more mature in the cryptographic space, Electronics Virus and Data Key are vendor specific implementations and they don't really promise anything in the way of uh, vendor neutrality, so that's a bit of a trade-off. Uh, smart cards are this year, we're going to see uh, quite a few um, that meet FIPS level two, possibly one or two, even ISO smart cards that, that satisfy FIPS level three. Cryptographic APIs is, is, a, con is a challenge or orthogonal to the notion of a cryptographic service, a network service. By the way, PKI, technically, you should think of as something a little different than DNS. It's just, it, it's not an application, it's a service that, that enables other applications, and it should be equally invisible to anybody. Cryptographic APIs is a, uh, um, a layering challenge on platforms, and it should have uh, no relevance to the PKI and vice versa. But uh, the key APIs today are Microsoft's and PKCS11. Uh, there are other viable alternatives, several uh, superior uh, uh, technically, but not yet uh, implemented anywhere. Another challenge, by the way, in smart cards is interoperability. Uh, the, the biggest hope here seems to be P uh, PCSC, uh, which is uh, Personal Computer Smart Card which is uh, ostensibly a vendor neutral uh, um, uh, initiative, but really it's a Microsoft attempt to uh, uh, create a product differentiator for Microsoft. It will never support anything else. Sun is involved, not because Solaris will ever use it, but because Java cards will use it. Um, 
So uh, we hope to enjoy uh, better neutrality, at least in the Wintel environment or the blue screen environment, um, in the next year with uh, PCSC. Uh, most implementations now support PKCS11 and the Microsoft Capy with PCSC, but that doesn't really help you with Macintosh and, uh, and Unix boxes yet. Um, Archive interface, generally the, the whole notion of uh, supporting business signatures in the future, the PKI's responsibility ends at uh, being able to provide a certificate or a certificate revocation list eight years from now or something like that. And there, there's no standard in that area at all. Uh, the uh, interesting directory, um, directory uh, clients can uh, until very recently have not been able to support multiple values in any particular attribute. It's, it just became stunning. We were the first uh, PKI on the planet that issued more than one certificate per subject. And so Novell didn't support them. No X500 vendor in the planet supported them. Netscape didn't support them. Microsoft didn't support them. So if you, if you posted two certificates in the user certificate attribute in a directory, the, every client on the planet would only see the first one. The LDAP or DAP client or Novell client would, would pull every value, but only pass up the top value to the application that knows the difference. Um, uh, Multi-component relative distinguished name, basically uh, the right answer is probably going to be common name and a UID together in the, in the directory name and the certificate subject. Uh, directories, uh, the fundamental thing about directories, uh, people haven't realized this and, and it's worth getting out, it's, it's becoming more obvious. Directories support delegation, databases support normalization of data. They're two radically different concepts. Uh, the right answer is both. Um, Neither supports both. Uh, the notion of normalization is a little bit different for directories, but it's, it's the closest uh, analog. Basically, uh, X500 has a single hierarchy that is supposed to uh, support the meaning, naming, and management of every characteristic associated with every object on the planet. And that makes no sense at all. People that understand or manage phone numbers already have some hierarchy of, of responsibility to manage those. People that understand land printer assignments are already delegated through whatever is, is management scheme is optimal for managing land printer assignments and, and, so, and so forth. So there has to be a separate hierarchy in the technology to support the, the management of the access control instructions at every node in each one of these hierarchies. And you, so there has, there has to be many uh, uh, directory uh, hierarchies. And that's where um, meta directories really have value. Meta directory vendors don't even understand their value. They think of themselves as a protocol and name translator. But it, uh, they are the, the glue necessary, not that, that it's, it's a good technology, but the concept is what is necessary to be able to map different concepts about the same human subjects for reasons of, of uh, having the local area administrator know who you're talking about and, and the uh, bank to know who you're talking about. And then also so that the owners of the information can manage their, their information invisibly. Trusted distribution of the root certificate is a tough challenge. Uh, we have like 63 different uh, uh, roots in all the Microsoft and Netscape clients. That's, not, that, that's pretty much just shotgunning it. Uh, we don't know what the right answer is here, basically. The right answer is going to be putting the trusted root certificate in those smart cards when we get there, but uh, the, the commercial community hasn't thought about this yet. Uh, tactical users and separate routes. This is the notion of uh, coalition interoperability, which is a big challenge for PKI. Um, what, again, what the PKI is trying to do, we're trying to solve the general problem first and then start focusing on the special problems, even though they're, they're possibly even a higher priority, certain for many people, many of the leadership within DOD. Um, we cannot promise anything more than uh, identity of the individual at a, at a static level and at a mod uh, moderate level of, of assurance. Uh, the level of assurance may not be adequate uh, for coalition interoperabilities. And in any case, the population we're addressing does not span uh, what would be an entire coalition. And we, we also talked earlier about uh, the need to have a different route to reflect the different domains of trust. Well, a coalition. It, it, um, People talk about NATO interoperability or interoperability with allies. That's more of a, at a national level. Boy, is that the blue screen of death or what? Or is this a battery? OK. Um, <laughs> the, uh, that's an example of uh, something the PKI cannot help you with. It is, not the, it is not the answer to everything. I'm never overselling PKI. Um, the um, uh, NATO secret, is that more secure or more sensitive or less sensitive than uh, US secret? Depends on who you ask. 
Um, the, basically, uh, most of the money being thrown at, and I, I mean that literally, at uh, uh, ally interoperability have been addressing it at the, at the national level, State Department, uh, Ministry of Defense level, or at the NATO level. Uh, coalition interoperability is a radically different challenge. Some of the challenges are similar, but the way you would, you would address them are radically different. It, it seems to me that the only way that this is going to make sense is that we have something like a flyaway kit where a new coalition that suddenly st stands up can flip a switch and install a route and the CAs that can issue the certificates and then issue certificates to everybody in that, that coalition. Even if that means they now have two certificates, one for their French you know, a command or, the, or defense department and one for the coalition. Um, and then you address uh, interoperability between them from the relying party perspective the way you would with cross-certification. Public or private key interoperability is a separate challenge. Again, if, if um, you, you're, you can have different applications that can only talk one PKI because the private key is in a particular format. Um, but then you have to think about supporting an application in a coalition environment with uh, public key cryptography. Uh, we, we already know MLS is a very significant challenge in coalition challenges. How would you, now again, PKI has, has a very limited um, ability to support your functional requirements. It's a means to an end. Um, there are only certain things that PKI uh, certainly provides a significant benefit for. Uh, being able to remotely authenticate without a priori uh, credentials, being able to encrypt something to someone that you've never talked to before. Um, um, it's basically asymmetric uh, crypto protocols and store and forward kinds of things where you can't use uh, Diffie Hellman or something like that real time. But uh, if, you're, if you're going through a guard, oh, it is? Wow. Just so, uh, I'm here till six. Where do you want me to go? We will go to 529 uh, and see if anybody's using that. That was actually the last slide. <laughs>